Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. And welcome to this week's edition of The Porter Report with investigative journalist and historian Gareth Porter. Thanks for joining us, Gareth. Hi, Paul. Glad to be back again. So what have you been working on this week? Well, this week, I, over the weekend, I just published um, a major investigative report on the, uh, the real level of civilian casualties in U.S. drone strikes in Pakistan as based on the uh, actual data gathered by a Pakistani lawyer for the families of the victims of drone strikes and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in London uh, based on their interviews with eyewitnesses and others in the areas where the strikes take place. Uh, this is really uh, the first uh, effort to come up with a, uh, a set of data that can be compared with the uh, data that's been published by the New America Foundation on its website, something they call Year of the Drone, which keeps track um, of every strike that is covered in the news media and keeps a running tally on casualties. And so what we can do now is see that the New America Foundation has been systematically underestimating or underplaying, underreporting the number of civilian casualties in the U.S. drone war in Pakistan over the past three years. And what are, what are the numbers that, that now that you think are, are correct? Well, uh, the numbers are, there are a lot of numbers in my piece, and in order to really boil this down to the simplest terms, what I've done is to combine all of these strikes uh, in 24, the data on all the strikes in 24 cases, which involve 11 strikes, which uh, uh, the Pakistani lawyer, Shahzad Akbar, gathered material on, and 13 strikes on which the Bureau of Investigative Journalism gathered material. Uh, and, and combining all that data, what we find is that the number of, uh, the proportion, I should say, of the civilian casualties and the total casualties, which was reported by the New America Foundation as being 38 percent in these 24 strikes, is in fact 70 percent. Uh, that's a huge difference. It's an 84 percent increase in the proportion of civilians in the casualties reported uh, in these 24 strikes. So it's really quite a major revelation. It's, it's a major reversal uh, because previously uh, civilian casualties were being reported as a fairly, uh, but certainly much less than 50 percent, and now they're much more than 50 percent of the uh, casualties in this, uh, in this set of 24 strikes. And of course that's leading, leading to increased outrage in Pakistan. Well, definitely. I mean, these strikes, everybody understands that. I mean, no, no one denies that the drone war in Pakistan has created enormous anti-American sentiment throughout the country, um, and, and particularly, uh, of course, in the areas where the strikes have taken place, they generate not just anger, but I think it's, it's generally agreed that the Taliban and other, and al-Qaeda and other groups have been able to generate more enthusiasm for support for the, uh, for the jihadist sentiment that they represent. So, I mean, it's by every measure that uh, is available, there is no question that these strikes are precisely doing the precisely the opposite of what they're supposed to do, which is allegedly to weaken uh, the uh, al-Qaeda hold on the uh, territory like North and South Waziristan, where the strikes are taking place. Uh, and what we can say, really, I, you know, it seems to me, is that this, uh, this, set of this new set of data underlines more clearly than ever before that what's really going on is that U.S. policy on the drone war is not being guided by any objective assessment of U.S. interests, security interests, or any other interests. It's being guided by the bureaucratic interests of the CIA, uh, which is, of course, responsible for the drone war in Pakistan and elsewhere and which has a vested interest in keeping this war going because their budget, their manpower, their mission has been built up for the past few years around the drone war in Pakistan right. particularly. And, and in uh, today's, uh, Monday's Guardian, Glenn Greenwald writes that the U.S. is actually using what they call a sort of double tap, in, in other words, essentially 
a second strike after the first drone strike, deliberately targeting rescuers, which, which one would think has to enhance or increase the possibilities of killing civilians. Right, and let me make it clear that the 13 strikes that I talked about having been researched by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism were all strikes which are precisely the ones that you were talking about. They're strikes that are targeted against either mourners at funerals of victims of previous drone strikes or striking at the rescuers of people who have been either killed or wounded in uh, previous drone strikes. So obviously this is a very important category of drone strikes. And, and what we find is that the uh, percentage of civilians, again, in the uh, strikes uh, that the Bureau of Investigative Journalism uh, researched based on local contacts, eyewitnesses and others, was much higher. It was, uh, it was roughly twice as high uh, as it had been reported by the New America Foundation. Right. And what, el what else have you been following this week? I know you've been written not very long ago about the debate in Israel over attacking Iran. Right. The story that I published last week uh, for IPS was a story that uh, looks at two particular interviews that were apparently given by Defense Minister uh, Ehud Barak, in which, uh, uh, in the first one on August 10th, uh, he suggests, well, what we really want, what the uh, Netanyahu government really wants, is for the United States to uh, uh, say publicly that uh, if the Iranians don't shut down their, their nuclear program, uh, the United States will simply destroy their uh, entire program next spring. But he said, well, we really can't expect the Americans to do that. That's not the way things work. They can't um, really commit themselves to something that would be in the next administration. So then uh, five days later, on August 15th, another interview, which uh, has all the earmarks of an Ehud Barak uh, interview as well, although they don't identify him in either one of these two interviews, says uh, that, that what Israel is ready to do uh, is to uh, uh, reconsider, quote unquote, its uh, uni unilateral military option of striking against Iran if the Obama administration would simply uh, do a couple of things. One, reiterate what Obama said in his APEC speech that uh, Israel has uh, the right of self-defense and that the United States will not allow uh, Iran to have a nuclear weapon. And then, uh, more importantly and critically, associate uh, the United States with the Israeli red line rather than the previous Obama red line, which is that Iran may not have the capability uh, to, to have a nuclear weapon, that is the technical capability, rather than actually make the key move which uh, intelligence would interpret as a sign that Iran is moving toward weaponization. Those so, are two very different red lines. Yeah, and the, what Ameri want, the Americans keep saying over and over again there's been no decision to go ahead with a, a weapons program, but Israel's saying that's not enough. We don't even want them to be in a position to make such a decision. Exactly, and the Israelis do not disagree with that intelligence finding. They're, it's very clear that they agree with it, and what they're saying now is that they, nevertheless, they want the United States to say, in effect, that uh, the, the uh, U.S. will attack Iran if the Iranians uh, continue along the line of uh, continuing to build up their uh, uranium enrichment capabilities. And I, I feel like we can't ever discuss this without reminding everyone that Israel has probably hundreds of nuclear weapons. And I guess one can draw one's own conclusions about the hypocrisy of all of this. But you and I have discussed well, some... Sorry, go ahead, Gary. It's not just hypocrisy. It's also, I think, uh, the point I was trying to make in this article and in previous articles is that the, the Israeli uh, threat, such as it is, because it's not an explicit threat to attack Iran, but the suggestion that uh, the Netanyahu government is seriously considering uh, an attack on Iran uh, in the future is really not serious. This has been all along a way of leveraging pressure on the United States and other countries to do more, and specifically in the case of the United States, to try to push the U.S. in the direction of the, the demand which was uh, outlined in that second, uh, well, in both of those interviews that I mentioned. Right. And, and you and I have talked about this before, but again, I, I think it bears saying again. Uh, and while, while all this debate and attention is on the issue of will Israel attack or not, and of course that's of, of great significance, but there's a real economic war against Iran already going on at a time when U.S. intelligence says there's no weapons program. 
and, and the sanctions are, are, are certainly a form of economic warfare. They are an economic warfare, and, and how effective they will be is, is still an open question, uh, very hotly debated uh, both in Washington and elsewhere. Uh, some people believe that the Iranians will certainly cave eventually, maybe so, but uh, <laughs> one of the stories that has come out this week, which I think is very important uh, for people to understand, is that the Iraqi government, the one that the United States put into power uh, uh, through its occupation of Iraq, uh, is now being found to help Iran uh, greatly to get around the U.S. sanctions. And this is only one of the ways in which Iran uh, has been able to do so. So it's not at all a black and white case, to mm -hmm. say the least. All right. Thanks very much for joining us, Gary. Thank you, Paul. And join us next week for the Porter Report on the Real News Network. And if you want to see more of this kind of programming, don't forget there's a donate button over there somewhere. Because if you don't do that, we can't do this.